Would you stand and sing with us? He lifted me out. Page number 284. I was out on the Broadway. I was out on the Broadway of sin and despair. Crushed me by burden of sorrow and care. My constant companions were trouble and doubt. Till Jesus reached down and lifted me out. He lifted me out of a deep miry clay. He settled my feet in the straight narrow way. He lifted me up to a heavenly place and flooded my soul each day with his prayer. Page 284. I was wandering afar from my Savior and home. Fainting and weary in sin did I roam. I needed a hand to turn me about. Then Jesus reached down and lifted me out. And he lifted me out of a deep miry clay. He settled my feet. He lifted me up to a heavenly place and floodeth my soul each day with his grace. And I was building my home on the dry shifting sand. Casting my lot in a cold, barren land. You're doomed now for a. I heard Satan shout. And lifted me out. He lifted me out of a deep, miry clay. He settled my feet in the straight, narrow way. And he lifted me up to a heavenly place and flooded my soul. Each day with his grace, I started, I started for heaven, my heart filled with song. Wandering is over, my sins are all gone. Through Jesus' own blood, cleansed within and without. Oh, praise his dear name, and he lifted me out, and he lifted me out of a deep miry clay. He settled my feet. In the straight, narrow way, to a heavenly place and flooded. Let's sing verse 4 again. I started for heaven together. And I started for heaven, my heart. Yes, wandering is over, my sins are all gone. Through Jesus' own blood, cleansed within and without. And oh, praise his dear name. And he lifted me out. And he lifted me out of a deep miry clay. And he settled my feet in the straight, narrow way. And he lifted me up to a heavenly place. And flooded my soul each day with his grace. Remain standing for prayer. How many of you know what it is to be lifted out tonight? Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank God for Jesus. Yes. Where would we be and what would we be doing tonight if we had not met the Lord? I just hate to think what I would be into. I hate to think what you would be into. Thank God he turned our lives around. Yes, Wonderful. Well, good to see each and every one of you. We have visitors with us tonight. Make yourself at home. Want to welcome everyone that's joining us via live stream. Glad that you're worshiping with us tonight. Hope that you receive a blessing. Glad to have uh, Brother Lazier with us. And uh, he hails from Greenville, Tennessee, and he'll be our speaker tonight. And uh, Brother Kelly, he got home safe. And um, he told me to thank everybody, and he, he felt like he was blessed, and he, he got as encouraged being here as you did in having him here. So we thank God for that. Brother Kelly's not well, and he's working on that, so remember him in prayer. We uh, want to go to the Lord. Uh, before we do, 
We'll be having a meal uh, this coming Sunday morning, just a reminder to the local congregation. If you will, uh, be thinking about bringing desserts in when you come next Sunday morning. We're so thankful for the crew that uh, provided the meal last Sunday. We had a great time and the food was delicious. And we want to thank Sheila and all the workers. They did a fabulous job. All right, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We especially want to pray for our country, those that uh, have lost loved ones through the virus, those that have contacted it. Just pray our country is in a, in a difficult place, and we want to pray earnestly, and we want to pray that God will help our country. We need the Lord, folks. We need him. We see things going on that we never imagined we would ever see, but... You know, it's a sign of the times, so let's definitely pray for America. Pray for those that are dealing with this COVID. And then we've got local burdens that we'd like for you to remember. We've got members in the congregation, some having to go in. Uh, 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 Hoss, your mother going to have the surgery or don't know yet? Okay. All right. She has to have kind of a major surgery. And at her age, they're trying to work out what's best. Want to continue to pray for Sister Lewis, also Sister Linda, Brother uh, Jay Crouch. And then I'll take your burdens by an upraised hand. And uh, let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to ask our song leader, uh, Brother Sherm, if he'll come and word the prayer for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Here we are again. What a privilege it is to come in from the world, to be able to sit at your feet, to learn of you. My God, to be challenged by you, to be strengthened. You're our hope. You're our everything tonight. If we make it through from here to glory, it's going to be because of you. We love you. Father God, you see our hearts tonight. You see all the things, Lord, that trouble us. And Brother Kelly has so covered all these, many of these things in the past services. But God, we still need you. We're looking to you. We trust you. And God, we believe that you're doing good things right while we're standing here. We pray for everybody in attendance tonight. Maybe we each one be ready to worship you in spirit and in truth. To take seriously the things that are happening in our lives tonight. We pray for our brother. As he stands before us, Lord, and preaches your gospel. We've heard him many times. And God, he's never failed us. And you've never failed him. We ask you, God, that you would just speak to us. Help us to learn. Help us, precious God, to be challenged this night to go out and do a better job for you in the future. Have your way in our hearts and lives. Be with those that are discouraged, those that are troubled. Lord, we pray that you would give new hope, new grace, and new strength for every one of us. May we be lifted up because you are lifted up tonight. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. The soul of man is like a ship that sails on the sea of time. The storms may come and the winds may blow and rock this ship of mine. But the reason my ship will never sink and today is still afloat. His, my compass is 
his precious word and Jesus pilots my boat. I won't sail these stormy seas no more unless Jesus leads the way. I won't ever drift so far from the shore for I hear what he has to say. I belong to a fleet that sails today on a glorious My soul pulled into safety's port, my stern was torn apart. The bow of my vessel was so badly crushed, since waters had flooded my heart. I had sailed so long on life's angry ways with my cargo, fear and despair. Then I called on his name, and he lifted the blame. Now he pilots my ship every
my chains were broken, I was born again. That moment when mercy walked in. I'm so thankful for mercy, aren't you? Amen. We're so undeserving. While we take our evening tithes and offerings, if you could, in your uh, big books, turn to page number 335. There, no friend like Jesus. 335. There's not one. There is not a friend in the trite seats of life. He can hear the heart's faint whisper, calm the tempest raging strife. There's not a friend, there's not a friend like Jesus, patient, tender, kind, and true. If you'll be a friend of Jesus, he will be a friend to you. There is not a friend like Jesus, bid the scoffing world unto you. For if you're ashamed of Jesus, he will be ashamed of you. There is not a friend like Jesus, patient, tender, kind, and true. And if you'll be a friend of Jesus, he will be a friend to you. And there is not a friend like Jesus, trust him everywhere you go. Has trod the way before you, suffered every pain and woe. And there is not a friend like Jesus, patient, tender, kind, and true. And if you'll be a friend of Jesus, he will be a friend to you. There is not a friend like Jesus When you draw your life's last breath If you'll be his friend while living He will be your friend in death And there is not a friend like Jesus Patient, tender, kind, and true if you'll be a friend of Jesus, he will be a friend to you. And there is not a friend like Jesus. 
Jesus, what a blessed thought to be, folded in his arms of power, ever in eternity, and there is not a friend like Jesus, patient, tender, kind, and true, if you'll be a friend of Jesus. Jesus, he will be a friend to you. Amen. I believe Brother David Pound has a song. Let's pray for him. You know, every once in a while, I like to get on YouTube and visit Appalachian Lifestyle, okay? And the people that settled in the mountains and their music and their culture and their ways. So it's no surprise to all of you that I'm going to play again that claw hammer tune, I'll Fly Away. And uh, I just love it. And I might be a little tired of hearing myself, you know, play it, but I realize you folks don't always <laughs> hear it. So here we go. We're going to try the best we can here. Oh, 
believe uh, Sister Caitlin has a song for us tonight. Let's pray for her as she comes. trio before the message let's uh, pray for them as they come what a beautiful song 
Kaylin just sang. What a beautiful thought, a beautiful promise. I don't know if you caught the words of that last verse of the congregational song that we sang, but it says, there is not a friend like Jesus. What a blessed thought to be folded in his arms of power ever in eternity. What a privilege we have to come here and to worship the Lord. And I was thinking tonight, as we were singing that song, I was thinking how many times over just my lifetime I have went to the Lord in prayer and cried out to him. Anything you can imagine, man has cried out to God for help. And he has not one time been unfaithful to those cries. You think about that. Jesus is my all in all. He's my all in all. And you could just, there's an endless list of him being our redeemer, our savior, our healer, our provider, our forgiveness, our righteousness. On and on and on, Jesus is our everything. And he is worthy to be praised. I praise God tonight for what a wonderful Savior that we have. You are my strength when I am. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all the You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. And seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, you give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, Taking my cross, my sin, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. And when I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name.
Sorry, let's pray for Brother Zim, Zach. Comes. This song is about a this song is about a storm. And I don't have to tell you we are in a blizzard out there. The winds are strong, ferocious, and are mean. And if God will intervene, we are in dire trouble. We are in trouble right now, emotionally, financially, spiritually. There's so much trouble we are facing, it's overwhelming sometimes. But there's a God that knows how to stop the wind. <laughs> he can stop the storm. <laughs> and he can right all the wrongs. And I'm so glad. And he knows. He knows every problem. And he knows all your hurts. I'm so glad.
<laughs> well, thank God for the good music program. It's amazing to me that those so wonderful sounds come out of that hunk of metal. That brother can play. I think if you let that sax go, it would just walk right across this pulpit. But thank God for the good singing, the good playing. Connor playing the drums. Good to have Connor with us. Does a fabulous job. And Brenda, our piano player, and all of our players on instruments and singers. They prepare our hearts wonderfully for the Word of God. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker, Brother Nathan Laser, and he pastors the First Church of God in Greenville, Tennessee. And he's going to be with us for a couple nights. Well, he'll probably be here a few nights, but he's going to be preaching tonight and tomorrow. And uh, we're so glad. I had him originally scheduled uh, after I had a couple cancellations, and he had to, he um, was in the midst of a vacation. And he came back and he let me know last week or so that he could come up. And I've had a couple, two or three cancellations. So we were really juggling ministers. But um, we thank God for those that God sent our way. And we're looking forward to the second leg. And then Brother Glenn Sizemore, he's back there in the audience. And he's going to be preaching uh, for us on the weekend. And um, just love the the different styles uh, of ministers and the uniqueness of their gifts that God gives them and what a blessing I love the variety of uh, ministry that we have learned to love and appreciate in the church of God and they can all preach and thank God for that so brother Nathan if you will please let's receive him with a good amen Well, it's me again. Last week when your pastor and I were talking about the possibility of me coming up for a couple of nights, uh, I went into the kitchen after that conversation and said to my wife, Honey, I think I might, uh, might run up to Newark and, and uh, preach a couple of nights. And she turned and looked at me and she said, You know what? I'm beginning to think you have a second family in Newark. And I said, well, sort of, sort of. Good to be here. Good to see so many familiar faces. I know you, uh, you are no doubt tired. I sense a degree of tiredness, so I'll make you the same promise Elizabeth Taylor made her seventh husband. I'm not going to keep you long, right? But I do want to look at Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 8. The Bible says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place where he would receive, uh, that he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelled in the land of promise as in a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky and multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Now in verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he, had, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. There are words that are perhaps overused in the, English, in the Christian vocabulary. 
And one of those words, uh, no doubt, is faith. And we use it in a lot of different ways. We'll say, have you found the faith? Are you keeping the faith? Have you lost the faith? Uh, do you come from this faith? Uh, what uh, faith did you grow up in? How were you raised? Which faith were you raised in? And it seems to me that perhaps in the overuse of the word faith, some of the meaning has been lost. And what I'd like to do with you tonight is to try to go back and to recapture the Christian understanding of what it means to live a faithful life. And I'd like to do it in, in two parts. First, I'd like to talk to you uh, and try to define faith as simply as I can. But then secondly, and then I want to spend the majority of time on the second part, I want to talk to you about what faith causes a Christian to do. And I want to use Abraham to drive that home. So first of all, what is faith? And then second of all, if you have faith, what will your life look like? What will faith cause you to do? And so when we talk about faith as believers, what are we really talking about? When we use this word, what is the scripture talking about when it says that we ought to be people of faith? In the Bible, faith is coming to a decision whereby you walk according to the word of God and not what you see around you. It's coming to a place where you say, I'm going to take the word of God at face value and I'm going to believe the word regardless of what my eyes see as going on around me. First uh, or Second Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith, not by sight. Now it doesn't say we walk by faith, not by reason. Some people read it that way. Faith has its reasons. But it does say we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by our faith, not by what we see going on around us. Now, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says that uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you put those two verses together. Faith comes by hearing the word of God and living like what we have heard is true. Faith comes through hearing the word of God and thereby not walking according to what we see with our eyes. Now, let me try to put that in some practical terms. Uh, there are females here who can identify with this, but we all can understand it. You might be a single female, and this guy at your job asks you out, and he's gorgeous, he's handsome, and, 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 and you say no, because you don't want to seem too eager, but of course you're gonna go out with him, so, but you say no, and you say, I'm gonna to talk to you in a day or two. And, uh, but, but, but you start to call your friends and say, do you know anything about this guy? Because he's gorgeous, he's handsome, but uh, I don't know anything about him. And the first friend you call says, oh, you better watch that guy. Uh, because he's handsome, he's sweet, he's nice, but he's shallow, he's shallow. If you go out on a date with him, he will nitpick you to death. If you get in the car and you don't lean over and unlock his door, that'll be it. If, if you're sitting down to eat and you spill something on your shirt, he, he's not going to call you back. He's not going home with a girl with lasagna on her shirt. That's not the kind of guy he is. Uh, how you dress is important. If you wear a big bow in your hair, you ain't getting a second date because he, he doesn't want to be seen with somebody who looks like they're a little girl. Uh, this guy is super shallow. Don't use Thousand Island dressing. He cares what you eat. It can't be a Thousand Island. He is super shallow. You say, but a guy that good looking can't be shallow. So you call your second friend. And you say, do you know anything about this guy? And she says, he's super shallow. He is absolutely shallow. Every relationship breaks up because he finds something stupid to break up about. You say, I can't believe it. He's church of God. I, 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 there's no way a church of God guy who's that good looking could be that shallow. You call your third friend. They say, no, you don't want to mess with that guy. He's shallow. So you go to work the next day and there he comes. He wants to know if you're going out. Now, you better walk by faith. 
and not by what you see. Because here he comes, he's charming, he's got a big smile on his face, but you've done been told by three people he's no good, it's not going to last, it'll be one date and you're done, you can't live perfect enough for that guy. And in that moment you have to say, I'm going to walk by faith. I'm going to walk by what I heard, not by what I see. Let me put it another way. Suppose that you need a good detective. And uh, somebody says, uh, I know a great detective. Uh, he solves every case. You need to call him because he can help you with your situation. And so you're sitting there, you're waiting for the detective to come by your house. And he shows up in this little French car and he hits your mailbox coming in. And when he gets out, he's blind in one eye, his coat's all wrinkled, and he comes up to your house, and, and he, he, he apologizes for the mailbox, and he's short, he's got the hair that he's always rustling, big thick hair, and, and, and every time he turns to leave, he says, now just one more thing, just one more thing. Uh, and you look at him, and you say, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. There is no way that this guy knows what he's doing. Now, you have to decide whether you're going to walk by faith or by sight. Everybody says he solves every case. Everything he goes up against, he figures it out. But when you look at him, he don't look like he knows how to get back to his car. And that's what every episode of Columbo is about, isn't it? Every episode of Columbo is about somebody deciding to walk by sight and not by faith. If they knew his record, they'd just surrender when he showed up. But they look at him, they understate him, and they walk by sight, not by faith, and they end up in the slammer. Let me give you one more. Suppose you're 16 years old, and your grandmother says, Listen, I want to take you to hear some good music. You think you know what good music is, but I'm going to take you to hear some really good music. I'm going to take you to hear a guy who is the best songwriter of his generation. Any award you can win, he's won at least twice. He's wonderful. You need to listen to this guy. You need to quit listening to songs that Taylor Swift writes about boyfriends who dump her. You need to stop that. You need to start hearing some good music. And so your grandmother takes you to this, to this coliseum. And out on the stage comes this old guy with pigtails and a bandana and blue jeans. And his guitar's got a big hole in it. And he sort of looks like he's smoked a lot of marijuana in his life. <laughs> and he comes out and he starts singing, you are always on my mind. And you say, this is stupid, I'm going to go listen to Taylor Swift. No, stay, walk by faith, not by sight. It's going to get really good before it's over. Christians are called to look at the Word of God. To take the Word of God and to say, whatever I see, however the world seems to be going, whatever is happening in my life, Whatever crosses my mind, whatever people tell me, whatever the experts say on TV, regardless of all of it, I'm going to go with the Word of God. I'm walking by faith, not by sight. Now notice what faith did for Abraham. The first thing that faith did for Abraham was this. By faith, Abraham went to a place that he didn't know where he was going. Abraham followed God by faith, and he didn't know where God was taking him. By faith. God comes to Abraham. Abraham's 75 years old. He's living in a place that would later be named Babylon. Today it's in Iraq. He's there. He's no doubt a wealthy man. Uh, there's reason to believe that his father was a man of great wealth, but he essentially doesn't have uh, a understanding of God. God comes to him in Genesis 12. He says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm calling you. 
and uh, I'm going to take you to a place. In the end, your children will be as the sands of the seashore. I've put my hand on you. And Abraham says, well, where are we going? And God says, I'm not going to tell you where we're going. I want you to follow me because of who I am, not because of where you think we're going. Follow me because I'm God, you're not. And to his credit, Abraham does what Greyhound used to say. He left the driving to God. He left the driving to us. It was the old Greyhound slogan. He leaves the driving to God, and God takes him a thousand miles. Abraham doesn't know where he's going. But day by day, he followed God by faith because he believed the promises of God, even though I'm sure there were days when he looked at the situation and what he saw didn't really measure up with what blessing looked like to him. Sooner or later, you have to walk by faith. You have to go in a direction if you're a believer. And you don't know where the end is. You don't know where God's taking you. You don't know the direction you're moving. Now, I was thinking of my life and uh, everything that I thought I wanted and everything I thought I would be has not turned out like I thought it would be. But it's always turned out better. It's turned out better. Uh, when I was a kid, I was 10 or 11 years old, and my mom went into a bank, and I looked through the glass of the bank into the president's office, and I, that picture is vivid 30 years later in my mind. He was sitting at his desk. His feet were propped up. On his desk, he had on a white turtleneck uh, shirt with a black blazer, and he had a golf club in his hand, and he was tapping his toe as he sat on the phone. And I said to myself, that's what I'm going to be when I grow up, right there. And that image stuck in my head for years, to the degree that I went to college to be an accountant, and then I was going to get a master's degree in banking. That's what I wanted to be for years and years and years. That was the image that I was going for. That did not happen in my life. Uh, I gave my life to God in my late teens. And uh, I don't know when he called me to the ministry, but I know that by the last year of my accounting degree, I had prepared to go and study for the, for the pastor, to be a pastor. It hasn't turned out like I thought when I gave my life to God. Uh, I remember I dated my wife three different times. <clears> three <throat> different times. That shows you how mature I was. Um, the first time we dated was when she was 17. Uh, it lasted maybe six weeks or so. I didn't think much of it, but we dated again, I think, when I was 22 or 23. It was the summer I was off from college. And I've never told her this, and I hope she's not watching. Honey, you had three days to forgive me, but I'm about to say. Uh, if you're friends with her, don't, don't PM her about this stuff. Let it lie. Uh, you make a powerful enemy. <laughs> I find out it came from you. Um, but uh, um, I remember going home and telling my sister after we had, the night we broke up, saying to my sister about the woman I'm now married to, I hope I never get desperate enough to ever be married to her. <laughs> That's what I thought. I hope it never comes to that. And I came home from college a couple years later, and uh, we, I went out with friends, and uh, she was there. And I forgot how pretty she was. And so I told my friends, leave me, strand me, so I can ask her for a ride home. And I can say, listen, are you going to leave me in the middle of the parking lot? you got to take me home. So my friend stranded me. I get in the car with her because she's a good-hearted person. She's, she's taking me home. And I ask her out. Finally, I, I try to, try to you know, you know get, her, get her interested again. And she looked at me and said, listen, I'll go out with you, but there's only two ways this is going to end. Either we're never going to talk again or you're going to marry me. <laughs> hey, that's a rough, that's a rough ultimatum. <laughs> A situation and uh, but 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 I, I I never thought I would end up with her um, 
I, I felt I, I had a call to ministry. And when you're called to minister, everybody wants to sit you up with a piano player. I just assumed I would be married to musicians. My wife can't sing a lick. But she's who God had for me. She's perfect for me. She can live with me. She can put up with me. And I love her, and I think she is a perfect specimen of a Christian woman. But I didn't plan. She wasn't what I was thinking. When I was... Uh, 18, 20, even older than that. I didn't want children. Did not want children. I wanted to be the guy, at least early on, who made lots of money and vacation in nice places and didn't have the responsibility of children. I didn't like children. Like children. Um, people who know me then think it's very comical that I have four and three are redheads. I love my kids, yours are cute. But, but it's just interesting that God, when I gave my life to God, the person I wanted to marry, or the person I thought I would never marry, I married. The job or the calling I, I never wanted, I never wanted to be a pastor. My dad went broke pastoring. I remember the dad was pastoring in Pennsylvania in the early 80s, and he was making $85 a week. <clears throat> and you say, well, that was the early 80s. Well, 85 was still pretty bad in the early 80s. And he got a raise. He went to North Carolina in 1984, and they bumped him up. He got a $15 a week raise. He was making $100 a week, which today is, uh, even with inflation, well below the poverty line. I just thought that's what pastoring was. And for a lot of great pastors, that's what pastoring is. And you have to admire men and women who sacrifice like that. I didn't want to be a minister, but God has given me the greatest gift of calling me into the ministry. I didn't want kids. I didn't want that. God has blessed my life with children. When you say, God, I trust you, one of the things that that means is that you leave the driving to him. If you're 20, you say, God, I trust you. That means you might get married, you might not. You might marry somebody you never planned on marrying. You may go into the ministry, you may go to the mission field, you may be the most Christian mechanic in town who leads many people to the Lord. You don't know what God has in store for you, but you say, Lord, my plans are finished. My life from here on in is, if the Lord wills, I will. And you have to keep things very loose in your hands because of that. People ask me, where are you going to be in three years? I really don't know. What are you going to do in five years? I don't make five-year plans. I don't know. I've learned to say, Lord, you do the driving. I just want to listen to your voice. I just want to hear you. But I hold it all very loosely in my hands. Abraham said, I have faith in you. And because of that, I'm going to follow you, even though you're not telling me where you're taking me. Secondly, Abraham, because of faith, said, Lord, not only am I going to follow you wherever you take me, but he says, Lord, everything that I have is yours. I'm withholding nothing from you. Verse 17 says that Abraham was tested by God one day, and God said, take Isaac, your son, and take him up on the mountain and sacrifice him to me. Give him back. Make him a sacrifice. Take the knife. Kill him. Give him back to me. And Abraham said, yes, Lord, there is nothing in my life that's withheld from you. Now, people have a problem with God asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. We know that ultimately God uh, sends, a, sends a ram. Isaac isn't sacrificed. But I would simply say this. In Abraham's day, child sacrifice was fairly common. It wasn't a big deal for a child to be sacrificed. In, in, in Abraham's day, and you say, uh, why was there a lot of child sacrifice? And I would say facetiously, because they didn't have the instruments to abort them. They had to wait till they were born to sacrifice. But we have the instruments, so we do it a different way. But it wasn't a big deal to sacrifice a baby. What was a huge deal was that God had given promises to Abraham. He has said, I'm going to make you a great nation, and it's going to come through that boy. That's why it's such a big deal for God to then look at, uh, look at Abraham and say, take 
the means by which my promises or you think my promises will come to pass and sacrifice it, kill it. Now, you and I are oftentimes faced, or maybe not often, but we will be faced with this. God, when He tests our faith, will look at us and say, the promises I've given to you, you think you know how they will come about. I'm pitting my wisdom against yours. I want you to kill the vehicle by which you think my promises are going to come about. This is really a pitting of God's wisdom against Abraham's wisdom. And Abraham has got to submit to God's wisdom. I mean, think about it. Uh, you may be in a, in a job situation. And according to the Bible, he will provide all of our needs according to his riches and glory. The Old Testament says, I've never seen a righteous man begging for bread. Jesus said, I know what the sparrows need. I feed the sparrows. I understand your need. I'll take care of you. So you come to the Bible and in faith you say, God has promised to provide for my need. But, but you're in this job situation. If you don't lie, you can't keep your job. You're in a situation where, 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 the, where the job is, is, is crooked. Maybe they're in tax trouble. And, and they say, if you don't join in this lie, we're going to fire you. And in your mind, you say, God's going to provide all of my needs with this job. With this job. This job is the vehicle by which he's going to fulfill his promises in my life. He's promised to provide my needs. He knows I need food and clothing and shelter. So he's provided me this job whereby he will fulfill his promises in my life. But God is saying, listen. I can fulfill my promises in your life with or without that vehicle in your life. You think the only way I can provide for you is for you to hold on to that job. But I'm putting you in a place where I'm saying, give up that job, give me that job, hit the unemployment line, and I will still provide for you in due time. It's a tough place to be. Sometimes uh, uh, single folks beating up on your singles. I'll, I'll give you a pass. Married folks are getting it tomorrow. Um, Sometimes, if you're a single woman, you know the Bible says that God says, I'll give you contentment. I'll give you peace. I'll give you life abundantly. Jesus said, I came to give you life abundantly. Those are the promises of God. But you can look at this man and, and say, I know he's not a Christian. But when I'm with him, I have peace and contentment. I enjoy the abundant life with him. He is the vehicle by which the promises are fulfilled in my life. And you know he's not a Christian. And you know that you cannot be a Christian hooked up with a non-Christian. You know that doesn't make any sense at all. Listen, if you were a single mother and you had a six-year-old child... And there was a guy who wanted to go out with you. And he said, I like you, but I don't like your kid. You would never go out with him. You would never go out with a man who would not like your kid because you love your kid. So how can you say, I love Jesus, but go out with a man who says, I, I like you, but I'm not so crazy about your Jesus. That, that is nonsensical. And the only reason you could go out with them is because you really don't love Jesus. It's not that big of a deal to you. So, but you're in this place where God is saying to you, listen, I can give you abundant life. I can give you peace that passes understanding. I can give you joy and contentment without him. I am asking you to sacrifice him. Because I can do it through another vehicle in your life. You can do it. I don't need him. Now, it can feel like a death if you have to give him up. It feels like you're killing your future. One more. Uh, we, we are having these conversations in our culture about sexuality. And one of the things that 
I'll hear from time to time is, <clears throat> how can God ask me if I feel that my identity is that of a lesbian woman or a homosexual man? How can God, because this is who I am, I, I feel like God has created me this way. Now, sexuality is notoriously complicated. There's nothing more complicated about the human experience than sexuality. And I would say this, you can feel like you were created a way, but it's still very much culturally shaped. I mean, you feel like you've spoken English, you've always spoken English from the very first word you spoke, it was English, but, but what language you speak is culturally conditioned. Um, the movements, the way that you, you work, there's a lot of things that are, seem innate to you, but, but it's still culturally conditioned. But you can be that individual and say, how can God give me peace and joy and contentment? How can he give me the abundant life if I have to deny what I feel is my self-identity. And God is saying, crucify it. It can come through another vehicle. But, but, but see, the crisis of faith comes when I say, God has given me this job. He's given me this person in my life. He's given me this position. He's made me a certain way. And he is fulfilling his promises to give me abundant life and peace and joy. He's fulfilling his promises to me through that. But, and God comes and says, no, no, kill that. Kill that. I can do it another way. I don't have to do it through that way. So he has this test of faith. And he says, God, anything you want me to give up, I'll give up. Anything you want. If it's a source of happiness in my life, I'll give it up because you can give me joy unspeakable full and full of glory without that. Anything you want from me, I'll give up. I'll lay down. I'll sacrifice if that's what you want me to. Because you can fulfill your promises to me regardless of any vehicle I've embraced in my life. Thirdly, Abraham not only follows God, not knowing where God's taking him. Not only is he willing to sacrifice anything that God asked him to sacrifice. But thirdly, because of his faith, Abraham was future oriented. It's interesting here that it says all of his life. He waited for the city which has foundations, which builder, whose builder and maker was God. All of his life, there's Abraham. And Abraham's never thinking about going back to Babylon. He's always looking for the city. He's always looking for the city built by God. And we don't, uh, you know, there's difference of opinion. Maybe that's the church. Maybe that's heaven. Maybe that's a third option. But Abraham was always looking forward. Always going forward. Always striving for that which was ahead. Faith drove him forward. Even when God comes to him in Babylon. He's 75 years old. And God says, you don't have any children, but you're going to have a son. And I think in my mind, there's, I have no Bible for this. But I, I think when God comes to Abraham and says, you're 75, you're finally going to have a son. I think Abraham went down to the store and he bought a baby buggy that day. And I can see Abraham going in and saying, I, 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 I want to see, see your best buggy. And, and the uh, store owner says, why, have you got a servant girl that's pregnant? And Abraham says, no, I need it for myself. And Guy looks at him and says, Abraham, do you know how old you are? And Abraham says, do you want to argue or do you want to sell a buggy? And so he buys the buggy and there he goes. And he's going downtown and everybody's getting a crick in their neck watching this old man walking down the street with a baby buggy. And somebody yells out, who's that for, Abraham? Abraham says, it's for me. And they look at them and Abraham says, don't lecture me about the birds and the bees. I know all about the birds and the bees. But we are going to have a baby. And he puts that baby buggy in a cart. A thousand miles they go across the desert. 
And he gets to the tent, the land that God has called him to, and he takes the baby Bucky, in my mind, and he puts it right there in the living room. Year after year, people come in and say, what's the baby buggy about? Abraham says, we're going to have a baby. They say, she's pretty old, isn't she? Yeah, but we're going to have a baby. God said we're going to have a baby. For 25 years, Abraham was focused on the future. I want to ask you something. Have you got any baby buggies in your living room today? Are there any promises that God has given to you? that you're holding on to, that you're not letting go of. In faith, you're saying, God said it, I'm going to do it. I believe that God is going to do this in my life. My dad was a country preacher. And um, he uh, felt a call to ministry in his mid-twenties. And my brother was very young, two, three, four years old. And dad believed that God was going to call one of his sons. And he only had one son at that time. So he was looking at my brother. Dad believed that God was going to call one of his boys into the ministry. But he was looking at my brother. And so when dad would buy books, when it was a good book, he would buy two copies. And there was his library, but on another shelf was the book's that he was accumulating for his son that God was going to call into the ministry someday. And those books accumulated on on that shelf. My brother grew up, and I think he's a fine man, but my brother did not go into the ministry. Years after dad began to accumulate those books, believing that God was going to call somebody in his family into the ministry, I was born the child of his old age. I planned on making a lot of money. But over 30 years after dad bought that first book, God called his son into the ministry. 30 years. It's interesting when I called my dad, and uh, I have a son of my old age. Uh, He's two and a half. He was born just a few months before I turned 40. But I, I remember calling dad. I have three older girls. And I said, Dad... I'm going to have a boy. And the first thing out of his mouth was, well, praise the Lord, we'll have another preacher in the family. (laughs) Those books were a baby buggy for my dad. For 30 years, they sat on the shelf. By the time I got them, they were dated. They were, you know, dating guy for 1972. Of no use to me. But those were a baby buggy in his life that God Somehow in his mind, he said, God is going to call one of my boys to the ministry. And those books were a remembrance to him that God was going to fulfill that promise somehow. I think of Job. Job chapter 23, verse 10. There in in the midst of his suffering, Job said, But the Lord knows the path I take, and when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. And in my mind, again, I don't have any Bible for it because Job was broke at the time. He didn't have any gold left. But I can see Job just painting a rock with a little bit of gold paint and putting it on his desk just as a reminder that someday, someday I'm coming forth as gold to this fire. I'm not going to stay here forever. Someday, it might be many years out in the future, but I believe, I have faith, God is going to bring me through this situation. I mean, you have backslidden children, wayward children. Listen to me. If I were you, I'd put a baby buggy in my kitchen. I'd buy a plant. And I would look at that plant, and every time I saw that plant, I would think about my kid. I would say, listen, Lord, There's seeds in the ground and that plant grew. I've put some seeds in the ground. I put a lot of word in that child. I took them to church. I drove them to church in the snow. I have prayed hours and hours that have accumulated into days and months for that baby. I am holding the word up that the word that has been put in that child will grow someday. I'm not going to grow weary. I don't want to be the kind of person who gives up. 
I have sown the seeds. I expect a harvest. And this is my baby buggy. And I'm going to keep praying. I'm not giving that child up. I am holding on in faith that something is going to happen that's going to bring that child back. The seeds are in the ground. Part of you that says, if you have faith, I'm holding on. God has given me some promises. This is a book full of promises. And I may not see it in my life yet, but I'm holding on. I'm looking to the future. I'm looking to a city. I'm looking for a son. Abraham's faith caused him to latch on and look to the future. Dennis Kinlaw, great theologian, preached on this. And he said... Uh, I'll never forget, he said, if you would have come up to Abraham and said, Abraham, what do you believe? Abraham wouldn't have started with his theology. If you'd have said, Abraham, what do you believe? He wouldn't have said, I believe in one God, uh, the Father and Maker of us all. I believe he created the world. I believe that he was pre-existent. He wouldn't have started there. If you would have asked Abraham, Abraham, what do you believe? Abraham would have said, I believe I'm going to have a baby. And I believe that baby's going to have some more babies. And I believe that before it's all over, my children will be as the sand of the sea. I believe that all this ground that I'm walking on, God's going to give to me. Abraham's uh, faith rested that God was going to fulfill the promises and word to him. Now, I should say this. It can take time. It can take time. The baby came 25 years later. And... I don't want to be critical of God, but there's something that God does that if I was God, I would do it differently. And we can all thank God that I'm not God. But one of the things God does is he often doesn't let you see the progress towards the promise. Think of Naaman. Naaman goes into the water, dunks himself six times, comes up, nothing's changed. But he goes under the seventh time, and his skin, which is leprous, is as white as snow. The children of Israel, they go around the walls of Jericho six times, nothing. Seventh time, the walls come down. In Egypt, nine plagues, it only gets worse. Pharaoh's heart continues to get hardened. Nine plagues, it gets worse, but then comes the ten. If I were God... I'd give a little bit of progress along the way. If I was God, when Naaman went under once, he'd get a little better. And the second time, a little better. And the third time, a little better. So it would encourage him. That's not what God does. If he did, it wouldn't be faith. If I had been God at Jericho, I'd have let some rocks fall the first time. So they can say, this is working, this is, this is going to be great. And then they walk around and, and they're full of energy, but six times nothing. Seventh time it happened. If I'd have been God in Egypt, I'd have given a little progress. Instead of Pharaoh hardening and hardening and hardening his heart, he would have been softening and softening and softening his heart. So Moses could say, well, it looks like it. next time, he, he almost let him go this time, but next time, I feel good about it. But every time, it got worse and worse and worse. God oftentimes doesn't let you see the progress towards the promise. So you got to be persistent. You got to keep the faith. You've got to hold on. You don't want to be Naaman who quits after six times. You don't want to be around the walls of Jericho and quit after six times. You don't want to be Moses in Egypt and saying, Nine plagues, nothing's happened. I'm going back to the desert. That's not what you want to be. You want to be a person of faith. A person of faith, again, is a person who will follow God wherever he's taking you. It's a person who says, God, everything I have is yours. There's nothing I'm withholding you. There's no person in my life. There's no hobby. There's nothing in my life that you can't have if you want it. But a person of faith is also individual. Who walks by faith, not by sight. Who says, I believe God is a God of his word. I believe he'll bring his children through the fire. 
I believe that what we put into our children, if we'll hold on, there's got to be a, a harvest sometime, somewhere. I believe that if it's quiet now, God's got to show up sometime. And when I come through the fire, it'll be as gold. I believe God's got some purpose in my pain, and I'm going to see it someday. I'm going to hold on. I'm going to hold on. My house is going to be full of baby buggies. There are some promises that I'm just going to hold on to. My life. Will you stand with me? Singers, will you come? I wonder if there's someone here tonight and it's just time to lay something down. God's been speaking to you and he speaks to us in strange ways. But he's put something on your heart and he says, I want you to give me that. You think I can't bless you without that in your life. Give it to me and watch how I bless you. Give it to me. But I want to speak to those of you who are here today who are maybe on the verge of quitting and giving up. The Bible says, do not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season you will reap a harvest if you faint not. Now you're in a place of fainting because it's been a while. But you don't know, you might have already gone under six times. The struggle in your life, the thing going on in your family, the situation with your kids, you don't even know it, but you've already gone around the wall six times. The promise is about to be fulfilled if you don't quit. You never know. You never know. So you have to come back and say, Lord, I believe. I'm holding on. I'm not giving up. I'm holding on to what your word has said. It doesn't look like it's going to happen. There's nothing in my life that says this is going to happen. The only th reason I believe it's going to happen is because I believe you said it would come to pass. And I'm going to hold on to that and I'm not going to faint. Maybe someone wants to pray and say, Lord, I'm, I'm still in this. I haven't quit. I've thought about quitting. I've thought about it, but I'm not going to quit. I'm re-upping. I am not throwing away the baby buggy. It's staying in the house. It's staying in the living room. I'm holding on to that promise for that child. I'm holding on to the promise that you'll bring me through this situation. I'm holding on to the promise that weeping may endure for the night, but joy is going to come in the morning. I'm holding on to that promise. In the name of Jesus Christ, let me pray for you. Father, I pray for this audience. What a wonderful group of people they are. Father, it's not by accident that anyone's here. The Bible says that it's only because you draw us that we come to the Father. And there are people who have been drawn into this room tonight because you want to do something in their life. Father, there's people who are hurting here. There's, there's at least one person, and there may be many more, but there's at least one person watching me right now that in the last 48 hours have thought about giving up. But Father, I pray that faith will rise. Faith will rise. Because they may have already gone around the walls six times. And if they'll just hold on, if they'll reaffirm themselves, if they'll lean on you, the promise can be fulfilled. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that they won't quit now. Amen. God bless you. Please. Amen. Page 332. Page 332. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way while we do his good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey 
trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Thank God for the message and how true it is. You don't have to serve God very long before you start to understand that serving God is an adventure, an exciting adventure. We may not understand, like Brother Nathan said, we give our heart to God and we're told that everything comes up roses and Jesus saves you and, and then we have a, a whole different set of struggles, problems, but I believe God brings everybody eventually through the wilderness. And the wilderness is not easy. But what he's doing is preparing a people to go into the promised land and fight giants and overcome all the obstacles. I think most of us can relate to what the brother was saying tonight. It is scary at times following the Lord. You've heard me share my testimony and others of you have shared your testimony. When I left my Ur of Chaldee in New York, I had no job, no place to live, very little money. But God told me to go. And I went west not knowing what was going to happen. But as I look back and as we all look back, Brother Nathan looks back, we eventually get to understand that God was wonderfully preparing us for what he was calling us into. And yes, there's pain, and there's struggles, and there's adversities, but the genius of God knows what he's doing. We may not understand it, and how many times have we lifted our voices to God and said, God, why this, why that? Why'd you allow this to happen? Why'd I have to go through this and go through that? But years up the road, you look back and you say to yourself, oh, what a mighty God we serve. And you may be in your walk this evening going through a, a wilderness place, a dark place. But I want to tell you, folks, you can trust God to take you through. We're going to sing one more verse. Thank God for these that have come. Our young people go through a lot of uncertainty in their walk with God. But if they'll hold on to God, they'll be able to look back and praise God and thank God for his guidance, for his faithfulness and for keeping his promises. So if anyone else needs to pray, we'll sing another verse. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sign nor a tear can abide while we trust and obey. Yes, trust and obey. Trust. 
satisfied want to make a couple announcements hello Thank God for the message. <clears throat> Tomorrow night, Brother Nathan will be preaching. And then uh, Brother Glenn will be joining us preaching Friday. Well, he's here, but he'll be preaching Friday. He wanted to come and hear Brother Nathan preach and get a little fellowship. His church is closed down. Or, well, I think they're going to open up next Sunday. So anyway, he's, he's glad to be able to come and help us out as well. Well, thanks for your attentiveness, and thank God for the good message. And all I can tell you is keep trusting the Lord. Amen? And don't forget to answer your phone.